Good morning, Fort Creek Baptist Church. Happy to see everybody here. I, for one, like the cold. I know not everybody's there with me, but I like it. I did not enjoy the wind yesterday. I like cold, but not windy cold. So, now that we're there, what? <laughs> Stand with us, please, if you would, if you're able, as we begin to worship. says in Psalm 9, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all of my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. That's an exclamation from a heart that loves the Lord. And I would challenge you, I would encourage you, and boldly declare you come to this place to express your love for the Lord. So make sure he's the center of what you're about today and your focus is on worshiping him. I want to share just a few announcements with you. Uh, first, today is Jim Martin's return day. 
and it is Jim Martin's birthday. So how about that? The Lord's just piling blessings on. Is it 47, 40? Yes, yeah, something, something. Sorry, I messed that up. So we are praising the Lord for Jim being here with us. And we don't do this for everybody's birthday, but it's a special day. Let's sing happy birthday to Jim. Can we do that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Good deal. That's the closest to leading the singing I'm ever going to get. So fantastic. A few things to make you aware of. Um, the Voices of Zambia will be here. Uh, this is a new item on our calendar on April the 6th. That's a Wednesday night. I think they've been with us in the past, uh, but it's a touring group. And you remember John Prater was here with the mission organization that sponsors them. Uh, so he's bringing the group that Wednesday night. We need a great Sunday morning crowd on a Wednesday night, right? I know you've appreciated them in the past. So put that on your calendar. Uh, April the 6th is coming up soon. And I, I noticed a lot of things in the bulletin. I won't read all of them to you. But the senior trip, the date is not in the bulletin. The 29th. Ma March? March 29th. If you read about the senior shopping trip, that is March the 29th. And this is the, the season and the emphasis on Annie Armstrong missions. That's the offering for the North American Mission Board. Uh, you've got envelopes. I hope you can get one if you don't. And I encourage you to give. We do have a video uh, giving you some more information about Annie Armstrong. Uh, we're also fortunate today to have a speaker from the Gideons. This is Danny Hagan. He'll be sharing with us a little later, and we'll, we're taking a love offering at the end of the service. We'll just do that on the way out the door, um, if we can have some ushers at the doors uh, for that. So let's pray, and then we'll watch this video and worship. And Lord, we thank you that we can be here. There's lots of people all over the world in great distress and great loneliness and great sorrow, and they don't know the good things that you have available to them. But Father, we're here, and we desire to see you and worship you. We thank you for all the blessings. It is just astounding for us to pause and consider how good you are to us. We pray that you would be glorified here, that you would strengthen us to lift up the name of Jesus. We pray as well that as you do that, we would be the voice of hope to all of those people everywhere when we encounter them and help them to see what's really important in this world. We give praise to you and thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a Christian nation. That's what some people say. Maybe that's why they often ask, why do we need missionaries here? There are places in North America where there are very few churches. People are very open to conversation, but nine times out of 10, they have not heard of Jesus. There is no pastors, there is no people can share the gospel with them. There's lives that can be made whole with the gospel. And we're watching God change people's hearts and change people's lives. But I wish people knew how many more laborers we need in the mission field because it's more than we can handle. Church planting is hard. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We need all the help that we can get, and that's what Annie does. It allows for more laborers to come here. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering unites us all, big and little, young and old, black and white. We all give because we know that when we do, our communities will look more like this. And we all give because we know there's a name and a face on the other side of that gift. This offering, this gift that we're giving to and that everyone else is giving to, it does have a face. It's my face. This is the body. This is the body of Christ. That's what any Armstrong means to me. If you would, stand with us as we continue to worship, if you're able.
Continue singing with us as our choir is about to lead us.
but it was on a Sunday morning. It was on time change Sunday, just like today. And uh, I was in Statesboro. I'm from Statesboro, Georgia. We were having a Gideon men's breakfast, preparing to send 20 or 30 men out to speak in churches like I'm doing today. And this man, burly man, walked through the door where we were meeting. He had a long beard, unkempt hair, his motorcycle leathers on. And my first thoughts were, well, bud, you're in the wrong place. And before I could tell him that, he said, I heard there were Gideons in this room, and I wanted to come in here and thank you. You see, when I first came to Statesboro some years ago, I didn't have a job. We didn't have a place to stay, so my wife, my daughter, and I were staying in a local motel. He said, my daughter was expecting a child out of wedlock. He said, I was not happy about it. In fact, he said, I told her that she would have to make her own way. I was not going to help her at all. That's, that's his words. One day after he had uh, been out working, he found a job. He came home, his wife, to the motel. His wife was crying. His daughter was crying. He said, what's going on? Well, his daughter had been reading the Gideon Bible there that had been put on the nightstand. And inside that Bible, she found a $100 bill. Some Christian put a $100 bill in it. Now, we don't promise if you go to a hotel or motel, you're going to find a $100 bill. We do promise you'll find something that is very spiritually rewarding and very, as far as your spirit's concerned, uh, very financially rewarding, the kingdom of heaven, eternal life. Let me give you a little update on that story. Again, this is a long time ago. Harold Pied is now the pastor of Marywood Baptist Church, and I asked you to pray for him and his congregation. They're having COVID-related issues that really, really are struggling. Uh, but that young boy that was born to his daughter out of wedlock is today a, a missionary to the African country of Uganda. It's amazing how God works, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. The Gideon ministry consists of Christian business and professional men who come together for one reason and one reason only, to share the word of God with the lost and dying world. Uh, today, to get here, I use my GPS. I'm sure many of you have one in your vehicle. I'm, I'm from Statesboro. I was, I've been by the highway here out from Stapleton, headed to see my daughter in Washington. Didn't know this place even existed, so forgive me. I'm not trying to be rude this morning, but I needed help to get here. You know, a lot of you have it on your phone. Just a couple of years ago, my wife and I went to Kentucky, and I thank God she was able to do it on her phone because I went places I'd never been and could never find again. But the Gideons deal with a different kind of GPS. Of course, GPS, you know what it is, Global Positioning Satellite. If you'll turn it on, it'll tell you where you are. It'll tell you where you want to go, and it'll give you the basic instructions on how to get there, right? But the Gideons deal with a different type of GPS. It's called God's Plan of Salvation. If you'll open it up, and you read in there, it'll tell you where you are in your life. It'll tell you where you want to go, the kingdom of heaven, and it'll give you the basic instructions on how to get there. A life lived with Jesus Christ pointed to the Father. Eternal life, holy life. When Gideons come to churches like this, we, uh, we like to talk about a ROY. Do you know what a ROY is? I'm not talking about an ROY, I'm talking about an ROI. That's return on investment, that's a business term. Well, God's words in Isaiah 55 11 talks about this. When God says, my word shall not return void. When you invest in the Gideon ministry, you should expect a return on your investment. God's word shared, whether it be here at home, across this nation, or across the world, has amazing results. People's lives are changed and transformed for him forever. In a little over 130 years, the Gideons have existed. And during that time, we've been able to distribute almost 3 billion copies of the word of God in 200 different nations, in over 100 different languages and dialects. How is that possible? It's possible because of the blessing of God upon us that we're doing his work, but it's also because of you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Because of your investment in this ministry, we're able to do these kinds of things. Without you, you take you out of the, the, the equation there, and we would not be, have been able to do as much as what we have done. God blessed his word as it goes forth. Typically, when we come to a church like this, we ask three things. 
And if you, I'm, I'm, hopefully nobody's ever heard me speak before because I'm like a broken record. I just can't keep repeating the same thing. But we do ask three things of you. We ask, would you pray for this ministry? I prayed for you. We believe in prayer. We bathe everything in prayer, everything that we do. I didn't even know I was coming here about three weeks ago. I got a word that, well, hey, we might need a couple of you guys from Statesboro to come help us. I began to pray about the church I would go to. I began to pray about the congregation. I began to pray for your pastor, and I didn't even find out his name until about a week ago. I began to bathe it in prayer. Ye have not, because you've asked not. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. The effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much. We bathe everything in prayer. We need to pray for open doors, and that sounds kind of silly, but that's what we need. It's kind of hard to go in a door that is locked. There are doors to countries that we're not available to go into. We need to pray for those. We need to pray for open opportunities to witness one-on-one. -on -one. We need to pray for opportunities for the Word of God to go in schools, college campuses, and universities. Whom would have believed that this very Sunday, two years ago, on Time Change Sunday, that we would, the following Sunday, we would not be going to church in Sunday school in the United States of America. Churches were closed down. Well, guess what? It has affected our ministry in, a, in a, a lot of different ways, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go on, but we've been locked out of a lot of places, and not, not because we're, we've done anything wrong, but just because of COVID. COVID has affected us greatly, and we need to pray that God will open these doors and windows of opportunity to share his holy word. We ask that you consider giving through the Gideon ministry. We don't want you to give to the Gideon ministry. Your gift goes through us. You see, we don't keep your money. 100% of your donation goes for the purchase and the distribution of his holy word. I'm not paid to be here this morning. I don't get gas money. I uh, don't get to turn in a receipt for a cup of coffee or anything. There will be no high-rise office buildings built, no jet airplanes purchased. Uh, nobody's going to get a salary. Your, your, word, your money goes to buy the word of God, and we don't own the first printing press. We have places, uh, reliable uh, printers all over the world that produce, reproduce what we need, uh, close to kind of control those distribution costs, and those distribution costs are going up rapidly. You can simply give what you have in your pocket, your purse. Uh, you can give purposely through our Gideon Living Bible Plan, where, uh, you know, I like to tell people, you don't have to die anymore. People used to say, it's called, in fact, we called it Memorial Bible Plan. You gave because somebody passed away, but why not? recognize your pastor will not recognize a Sunday school teacher maybe um, there's an aunt or uncle or a, or a brother or sister or some special friend that has done something or a school teacher that pointed you in the right direction in your life what a better way to honor them than to send a Bible in their name the hotel and motel Bibles uh, have an average lifespan of six years and the potential to reach 2300 people for Jesus Christ in the United States of America in some of our developing lands, uh, they last uh, anywhere from six months to six weeks. A lot of them are taken, and that's okay because we'll put them back. Martha was visiting a country outside of her native land. She did not have a relationship with God or Jesus Christ. That knew very little. She fell in love with the Bible on the nightstand. So when she checked out, checked out of the motel, she took the Bible, took it with her, and later on fell under the, the power and the conviction of Jesus Christ's eternal life. She, and she wrote us a note, so please go to this hotel, go to this room number, and put a Bible back and send me the bill. And I want to make sure that someone else has the opportunity that I have. And the third thing we like to do is we like to ask, and ladies, uh, don't go to sleep on me because I'm talking to the men, but I might need you. I might need you to throw an elbow. I might need you to squeeze a hand. I might need you to kind of tap your husband on the back or later on today say, did you hear the man, what he had to say? God is looking for a few good men. The Gideon ministry has lost a lot of men due to COVID. We've, we've been affected just like everybody else. We need men to do what I'm doing this morning, to go speak in a church. We need men to go into a public school where we're allowed to do so in this country and distribute the word of God. We need men to go on college campuses. Uh, I don't know whether they've, they've postponed it several times, but uh, uh, the University of Georgia uh, distribution Normally it's in the fall. They had it scheduled for a few weeks back. I haven't heard, but typically they give out about 30,000 Bibles there 
each year when they do that. We need men to go do that not only in your own community, in the hotels, the motels, doctor's offices, nursing homes, sidewalk distributions, but to do it across this land, to do it in foreign lands. And uh, perhaps you've, you've not thought about it, but maybe God is stirring you in your heart to do something. He did in mine, and I point you to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, and I'm just going to quickly paraphrase it. God told Isaiah, who will I send? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. I had that 30 years ago. 31 years ago, if you'd asked me if I would be in your church this morning speaking, I probably would have been polite enough not to laugh at you. Not outwardly, anyway. I would have laughed at you internally. I, no, I, no, I'm comfortable with my faith. I'm good going to my church. I'm good, good going to Sunday school. I don't need any part of this. God has stirred a part in my heart for lost men, women, boys, and girls. And I hope and pray that he'll stir some of you men this morning to get out of your comfort zone and go do what I'm doing today. Go and speak in a church. Go talk to someone. Go place the word of God here at home, around the world. As much as you're willing to invest yourself in, God will bless you and provide you with the opportunities. Let me begin to close this morning and... and uh, and I want to share with you out of Romans chapter 10. But I want, first I want to tell you about my friend uh, John Davis of Savannah, Georgia. I met him later in life after the events I'm about to tell you took place. But John was uh, uh, born the son of a painter. Uh, he realized very quick that uh, being a painter, you didn't make a lot of money. Uh, you, uh, he wanted to sell the paint. That's where all the money was at. He began became a very successful entrepreneur in Savannah, had a million-dollar home on one of the marshes down there. The contractor that was working on his house tried to witness to him about Jesus, and he said Jesus to him at that point in his life was a cuss word. Uh, it's what you said when you hit your, uh, your thumb with the hammer. And uh, he didn't have anything to do with it. Later on, he had an automobile accident, left him in constant pain. He began to take drugs, illicit drugs, and mix it with alcohol, Grew to the point that he even bought his own airplane and was going to South America and buying his drugs direct to cut out the middleman. Uh, after a very long story that I'm not going to share with you this morning, he went home one night to shoot his wife and his two young sons. When he got home, he, he passed out on the floor. He came to shortly thereafter, and his wife, he was on the floor. His wife was seated on the bed, and there were two Chatham County police officers like oak trees standing above him. And his wife told him, John, you got to get help. Well, he'd been in treatment facilities before. He, he lied and said, I'll go. Where do you think I should go? He, she said, there's a little place in Statesboro called Willingway Hospital that treats people with addiction, uh, things like, like what you've got. Would you agree to go? And so he said, what other choice I got, jail or treatment facility? He chose the treatment facility. It was on his last night. John discovered the Bible. He went to, to sleep with the Bible open on his heart on his chest with a prayer in his heart and said, God, if you realize this, show me. And God changed and transformed him. He, he became a new man, a new creation in Christ. He lives for him even today, even though he is not able to get out and do what I'm doing. I met him later in life as a Gideon, wonderful, amazing man. Again, Romans chapter 10, we'll close this morning, beginning in verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you today for allowing me to come to share with you what's going on in the Gideon ministry and to tell you that when we give God's holy word, we're, we're provided with those beautiful feet, sharing the word of God and the blessed feet of Jesus. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a great day. I'm a great fan of the Gideon's ministry. I don't know of a lot of organizations where everything you give goes to the need 
and it doesn't go in, in somebody's pocket. I love the airplane reference. Good, good job. By the way, we can get you a cup of coffee and a sandwich if you, if you need that before you, before you go. We don't want you to leave um, not being provided for. We will be taking up an offering. Uh, ushers, if you guys could position yourselves at the doors and the windows if we have to. And, uh, we want you to give to support the Gideons. Um, Jack McCorkle will be here tonight sharing in our evening service. I know many of you know him. And we're going to take offering again. So if you didn't bring anything to give this morning, come back tonight and be ready to give to the ministry of the Gideons. Uh, in 1540, Frederick Myconius was very sick and about to die. And he wrote with trembling hands a farewell letter to his friend, the great reformer Martin Luther. Luther then sent a letter back to uh, Frederick and said this, I command you in the name of God to live because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead. He will permit me to survive. He will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will and may my will be done because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Well, by the time Luther's letter arrived back with Frederick Myconius, he had already lost the ability to speak. He was supposed to be gone very shortly. In fact, though, he recovered quickly after that and did outlive Martin Luther by two months. Uh, Martin Luther, you hopefully have heard of. Martin Luther, the great reformer, if it were not for him, we would probably all be Roman Catholic and uh, submitting to some pope's authority and working to earn our salvation. Even if you hadn't heard of Martin Luther, uh, I'm sorry, even if you have heard of Luther, I bet you've never heard of Frederick Myconius. Most likely never heard of him. What is of great interest to me is how boldly Martin Luther proclaims his need, his dependence on this man, Frederick Myconius. He um, was very much in favor of uh, Myconius being around, being his help, his encouragement, his supply. And what he's really illustrating is the title that I've chosen this morning, and that is The Power of Partnership. The power of partnership. We're going to be in Philippians 2 here shortly. Um, we hear a great deal about famous people. You can name people that are famous throughout history and even today. People that are influential. People who have done incredible things. Accomplished great things with their lives. But I will guarantee you that behind every single one of those people is another person or Probably, most likely, a team of people who are helps and encouragements and supports and um, enablers. Friends who are invested in that person's life. And that person would have never been able to accomplish much if it weren't for those who were behind him uh, taking up the slack and doing most of the work and giving the support. So write this down. It's kind of the framework for what we're talking about this morning and where we see Paul's heart. Partnership dramatically multiplies your potential. Very plain, very simple. Uh, there's a whole lot more that you can do with somebody else helping you than you will ever be able to do by yourself. Partnership dramatically multiplies your potential. And this is a powerful, established biblical principle for the work that we have to accomplish in the kingdom. Let me give you a side passage in Ecclesiastes 4. It establishes this framework and then we'll be in Philippians. Verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm along? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, these are obvious points, right? And yet still, we build walls. We isolate ourselves. We, we draw into our own little caverns. We, we we don't want to sacrifice to make connections and to con contacts with people and build relationships. We, we don't want to take those chances or put the effort into something that would actually change our lives. So these verses are equally applicable in any and every situation because they emphasize in this most basic way the importance of surrounding yourself with people 
who will care about you and people with whom you will care about. It's a, kind of the illustration of what Paul is talking about in Philippians 2. Uh, we're going to see the personal side of Paul's life. He's going to talk to us about some deep needs, some deep concerns, some things he's feeling, and some commitments that uh, he has seen connecting with him. I've mentioned to you before, uh, the letter to the Philippians really represents what, what is a love letter to most likely Paul's favorite church. If he were shopping around for a church, this would likely be the one that he would have planted himself in and committed himself too. So we see his heart in the deepest level of dependence on close personal relationships. Friends that he can count on. Here's the situation, a little background. Um, this is the letter Paul is writing back to the Philippians after they have sent aid to him. So Epaphroditus has come to Rome. Paul's in prison in Rome. Uh, when you're in a Roman prison, they don't feed you. You're dependent on friends, neighbors, your church, if you had one at that point. You're dependent on somebody bringing the food in for you. So the church at Philippi has sent a care package to Paul. And they've sent it through a man named Epaphroditus. Epaps bringing news to Paul about the church. That's why Paul is able to compose this letter and tell them um, how to deal with certain situations. And he's writing this letter. He's planning to send it back with Epaphroditus. In the meantime, Epap gets sick. And word gets back to the church that Epap is sick and they're kind of distressed about this. They, they don't have enough information and it doesn't come fast enough and they don't know what's going to happen. And so Paul is planning on sending this letter and sending Epaphroditus back with the letter to give that assurance. And then uh, when he secures his own release, he's planning on sending Timothy to tell them, I'm out of prison, the ministry is wide open here, Let, let's go for it for the glory of God. I want you to notice um, in the passage the depth of feeling that Paul has. Just pick up on more than anything else the, the warmth, the dependence, the, the love, the affection that he has for these two men. And for this church. He is not coming to them with a stick to straighten them out. Even though we see necessary correction expressed in the letter. Uh, he's not coming with the collection plate, even though he doesn't shy away from asking for necessary help. He makes numerous references to that. He's not coming to preach to them, even though he's doing that now. And he will conduct necessary and ongoing instruction in the Word. His greatest purpose in planning the trip back to Philippi is right here in this passage, beginning in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. When I get word that I'm about to be released, I'm sending Timothy to let you know. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. I believe God's going to set me free from this. Verse 25. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help that you yourselves could not give me. 
Your package lasted two weeks, and then Epaphroditus went to work to earn money right here in Rome to be able to help and support me. This is an intensely personal passage. I think sometimes we read these kind of passages in God's Word, and we kind of glaze over them. Well, that's just a, a, a situational instructions about something going on between a church and another church, and, and get me back to the teaching, please. Well, this, this is some serious teaching. This is a serious expression of the kind of feeling that you and I ought to have for one another. And you and the person sitting next to you and that person over there. And by the way, that church down the street and that church across the county and that church in Ukraine or India or Europe or, or anywhere else. This is a description of what's going on in the heart of Christians for other Christians. We know that God has given us an almost insurmountable task. It is a a mission that never stops. The demands are great. The needs are all around us. The challenges are real. The enemy's throwing everything at us. He can. And it, more and more it seems these days. We understand that. We cannot fulfill the call of God. If we wind up trying to do it on our own. We can't do it if we do it in isolation. If you're just doing your little thing all by yourself, at some point, you're going to get whacked upside the head by something. At some point, you're going to get discouraged. At some point, you're going to need something that you're not skilled in or don't know very well or can't figure out on your own. So God puts us all together in this great miraculous thing called a church. And it's not just a place I go and sit in a pew and listen to great preaching. <laughs> That's a joke. I'm, I'm just messing around with you a little bit. It's not this place I go, you know, and sing great songs or, or ask people how they're doing this week. It's the place where my heart goes to connect with the hearts of other people at the deepest level. And he's describing that here. So I want to go through and help us understand what we really can see in this, this, um, this individual, this category that I'm calling true friends. True friends like these two men in Paul's life. So let's go through it and just get some lessons related to what friendship really is supposed to be. The first thing I want to say is true friends are rare. True friends are rare. Verse 19, he says to Timothy, I have no one else like you. I have a friend of mine back in South Carolina um, that, that is, is as close to me as a friend can get. He's, he's a guy that knows when I need to hear from him before I even tell him I need to hear from him, you know. He's a guy that he and I have both talked and said, um, I, I don't know how many friends I really have. You, you know what I'm saying. I don't know who the real friends are. I, I'm not sure there are that many. I think, in fact, if you could have one or two or three friends that are true friends, you are most blessed. You are most blessed. When the going gets tough, that's when you'll know who your true friends are. They're the ones who will talk to you while everybody else is talking about you. True friends, they're the ones who care for you when nobody else is showing up. When you've suffered a great loss and everybody swoops in to help you, they help you for a week or two, and then they go on with their lives. Who's there in week number three? Those are the true friends. True friends want to be where you are, and the harder it gets on you, the more you can count on them. Now, what I've done in this definition is take your, your broad category of faces and names and shrunk it way down. And those are the people that you need to know are your true friends. So hold on to them. <laughs> Hold on to them. Learn to value them above all. True friends are rare. True friends keep us going. Verse 19, he said to Timothy, I also may be cheered by you. You make me feel better. You increase my energy and my passion. Verse 20, he says about Timothy, I have no one else that is like sold. S-O-U-L-E-D. Sold. Write that down on your note page. The NIV says I'd have no one else like him. Honestly, the NIV does a great disservice to this verse. In the Greek, it says something much deeper and much more profound. What Paul is really saying is, I have no one else who is so like me. The word means like sold. It is the Greek word, uh, isopsychos. 
You hear the, the psyche word. It's about soul. It's about your heart. It's about the, the deeper place in our lives. Those are real relationships. When your heart can connect with somebody else. And when your friend knows how you feel and what you think and what you're dealing with. So he says to Timothy, nobody else knows me. Nobody else gets me like he does. It's a good, good thing to think about. Don't you want a friend like that? You need a friend like that at that particular level. In verse 25, Epaphroditus, he says, My brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. John Maxwell tells the story of a group of scouts and they're hiking in the woods. They come to a section of abandoned railroad. And you know how this is in covered in weeds and it's got the two rails and they challenge each other to see who can walk the furthest on a rail and they stand up they each try they make it a little ways and then two guys kind of get together and they whisper to one another and they get on one rail and the other rail and they reach out and take each other's hand and they just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going and the point's clear and Maxwell makes this observation there in a nutshell is a principle for modern societies families community living healthy ministries the day of the contented hermit the successful lone wolf those days are gone we do things better we produce more we live better lives by helping one another the person who lends a helping hand benefits himself while helping others practicing the power of partnership Maxwell's who I got the the title from this message practicing the power of partnership can make the difference between a good company or a poor company an effective ministry or an ineffective ministry a family that is thriving or a family that is sputtering and failing it's just the idea of how can I partner with this person how can I be the friend they need an amazing thing is when I'm the friend they need guess what happens they become the friend that you Need. It is a powerful thing. And the Bible is very clear about how important this is. If true friends keep us going, that means you better learn to enjoy them. Learn to enjoy them. That's on your note page. It is a, an effort that you have to undertake to develop meaningful relationships. Here's number three. True friends are best when they care about Christ more than they care about you. I, I love this concept. Paul doesn't just talk to the Philippians about his good friends, Timothy and Epaphroditus. He confirms to the church, both Timothy and Epaphroditus are the best friends they can be because they're sold out for Jesus. And they love Jesus more even than they love me. And they're devoted to the purposes of Christ more than anything else. And because of what they desire, they're helping me to desire that same thing. They're producing that in my life. Uh, the best friends you could ever have are those who actively are pursuing God's will in your life. They want you to know the Lord. They want you to hear from the Lord. They want you to experience the blessing that He brings. And so these are friends that are not working on their own agenda in your life. Maybe you've had some friends like this before. They're the ones who think it's their job to fix you. They think it's their job to fix you. Those are not true friends. They are seeking their agenda in your life. So don't be fooled. Sometimes they can disguise their own agenda by talking about God's will. Sometimes uh, they'll just come right, on, right out and say, I think God's will for you is. Uh, they don't know God's will for you. Can, can I make that as plain as possible? As hard as it is for us to determine God's will for ourselves, He's not typically going to go over to some guy and say, Hey, God told me His will for you is. So we've got to get to the point where we know how to discern from the Lord. And true friends are the ones giving us the, the caution, the advice, the wisdom, so that we hear from the Lord rather than hearing from them. Also, you don't want a friend whose focus is on the world's agenda. They want God's will in your life, not the world's pattern. Romans 12, 2, you're familiar with, be not conformed to this world. I like the Phillips paraphrase. He says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Isn't that a great? The world's always got a plan for you if you want to do what the world says. It's a plan that comes straight from the throne of the devil. 
straight from the pits of hell. And the enemy will always work to get you on his plan rather than God's plan. So we have people around us that are trying to influence us in some very bad directions. These are people, if you want to do the right thing, they'll tell you that's weird or somebody's going to think you're strange or you're not going to have any friends doing that or you're, you're going to be the oddball. Um, you don't need friends like that in your life who are trying to argue against living the right way or they want to entice you. You've heard all of these kinds of statements. It's the latest thing. Come on, everybody does it. Don't you want to fit in? It's what you have to do to have friends these days. This is how the world is today. Everybody's doing it. All of those things say to me, not for me. Not for me if that's what the world is about. It's all just peer pressure to take you in the worst possible direction. So a lot of people have problems in this area. I think honestly that younger folks tend to have more problems in this area. They haven't really established you know, their conviction, their, their absolute direction. They're not really sure in some ways in what they're deciding on. So, so let me just be direct and clear with you. If everybody's doing it, it's probably dumb dangerous and going to get you in a lot of trouble okay and everybody who has done it who knows how dumb it is can testify to that amen all your parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles are here to tell you don't do it don't do it don't do it it will only hurt you don't go after the world it will waste your time it will get you into trouble and whatever friends helped you get there when the trouble happens whoosh Those people are gone and you're on your own. And guess who you're going to call? Dad. That's who you're going to call. I look at my phone and it's one of my kids and I just can't help it. Your first thought is, oh no, what's happened now? You know? Oh no, what's happened now? Fortunately, that's not the majority of the time. You don't want friends who are trying to get you to follow the pattern of the world. You also don't want friends who are trying to get you to follow your own plan. Your own plan plan. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things. You know whose heart that's talking about? Your heart. Your heart. Even as a follower of Jesus, you still have the flesh nature and it is warring against you and it wants to get you on a plan that is not God's plan. So you need a friend who who doesn't say things like, just do whatever feels right. That's very, very dangerous. I've heard the smiling pastor from Houston say that plenty of times. That's not the way it's supposed to go. Follow your feelings. Your feelings will lead you in a ditch every single time. Don't follow emotions. Don't follow, you know, I dream this. I think that. It, it seems like. I, I, I hope. Maybe it will. None of that is a true indicator of God's will. God doesn't reveal Himself in your lives based on that. Now, sometimes He will confirm through feelings, through a sense, through a a clear perception of things. But you better be able to find it in God's Word. And the people who love Jesus that are next to you better be able to say, Yes, that sounds like what God's trying to say to you." you. Do you understand the difference? It's very important to get this. True friends care more about Christ and His work than they do about you. I want those kind of people in my life. They will help you stay on track. Here's number four. True friends have a track record themselves. Verse 22. You know that Timothy has proved himself. Timothy has proved himself. This is where you ask the question, how much can I trust him? How much can I trust her? If they're going to be my friend. It is a legitimate question to ask. Because there are a lot of people out there. Who won't care about you. But they are willing to pretend that they do. There are lots of supposed friends. That are your friend. Because they think they can get something out of you. They think that you're going to pay off for them. They see some advantage. So you've got to know whether this person is trustworthy and valuable. Your friends will prove themselves over time. It doesn't happen in a, in a night or in a short period. It takes time. You don't go into a bar and announce, I've got $100,000. Who wants to go into business with me? You don't go into a restaurant and say out loud, Hey, I'm looking for a wife. Who's interested? 
right? You don't just call a random phone number and say, I'm contemplating, contemplating the future of my entire life. Can you give me some advice? We know we need people that we can trust. I don't even follow advice on purchasing a pizza from somebody I can't trust a little bit. If I know you don't have good sense, I'm not going to ask important questions. you got to be able to trust them. But let me tell you the second part of this. Somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to decide, I want to know if this person can be a friend to me. I sense something, feel something in regards to their character, um, in their spirit, in in the the identity of who they are. I I sense a connection. I want to see if there's good potential for a relationship. So you have to take a risk. You have to open up to that person. You have to test the water. You know, you have to spend some time with them and start to formulate and hear from the Lord. Hey, this is a good candidate. This is a good person that I know Good things can happen from it. This is so important that the 20 failures, when you risk and it doesn't work out, those are worth it for you to find one good friend. It's worth it. And so we keep on going. We keep on trying. We keep on investing. And we keep on waiting for God to say, I got somebody for you right here. And that person will tie into your heart so powerfully that it can change so much about who you are and about your life. Here's number five. True friends are intimate. True friends are intimate. Verse 22, as a son with his father, he's talking about Timothy. He's not Timothy's father, but he's become like a father to Timothy. And Timothy has opened up to Paul to treat him that way. That that is a close bond of a relationship. Verse 26, he's talking about Epaphroditus. He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Let me just say it to you this way. These are the people that you cry with. Okay? Okay? These are the people that you cry with. Now, the devil's going to tell you some lies about crying. The world's going to tell you some lies about crying. Unfortunately, maybe your father told you some lies about crying. Wipe those tears. No man's going to cry. You can't be a man and cry. That's a lie. That's a lie. The Lord has given us tenderness in our hearts. He even commands us to have tender hearts. And if we're going to have real friends, we have to be able to express tenderness and joy and love. Men to men, women to women, in whatever relationship God's putting us with these people, we have to be able to feel it. If you don't have a friend that qualifies at this level, then you don't really have yet a true friend. It's got to be somebody you feel vulnerable with, somebody you're open to, somebody you can share hurts and brokenness and sorrow and failures. Those are where the, where the real friends are. You can be intimate with them. Here's number six. True friends protect your relationship and your reputation. But here, verses 29 and 30 again. Uh, when you... Uh, So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Now, Paul's not fussing at the Philippians. They did what they could. What he's doing is elevating Epaphroditus. He made this trip. He was not feeling too good when he started out. By the time he got here, he was sick. His life was on the line. He almost died, but he did it anyway. And then when the money ran out and he was better, he got a job and supported me at this time. What he's doing is protecting the reputation of Epaphroditus. He paid a price for me. He invested in my life. Very simply, guys, true friends are the ones who, when they say it, they mean it. I've got your back. Okay, I've got your back. And you know they mean it. These are the people that you could call at any point of any day and say, I need you. And there they are. These are the people that are looking out for you who will call you in the middle of nothing and somehow the Spirit impressed upon them the need. And and there's a connection and an opportunity there. You need friends like this. Andrew Carnegie said this, I owe whatever success I have attained by and large to my ability to surround myself with people who are smarter than me. I, I love that line. He's really illustrating this principle very well. Jesus said it this way. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last 
and servant of all. And that's the principle that really is it. If you're going to have friends, you know, you don't go and say, hey, will you be my friend? You go and say, hey, can I be your friend? Can I be your friend? I want to be involved in your life. I see the Spirit working around you. I think God's doing something great in your life. I I want to be connected with that. How can I help you? Let's go to lunch together. How can we pray together? You're looking to invest yourself that way. And what Jesus says is, as you live this kind of life, then He will bless you and honor you and work in your life. He, He elevates your cause if anyone wants to be first. Be last. Be the servant. That's by the world's definition. The first, that's by the Lord's definition. And it's a greater place by far. Pray with me. Lord, we give you blessing and honor and praise. And we know that you are everything that matters. Everything that's important in this world. And all that we need and care about. Thank you, God, for what you've done for us. Thank you for your word that says that you are the best friend that we could ever have. Greater friend. No, the one who lays down his life, you are the greatest. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. I pray that you would teach this to us. You'd get the principle clear and certain in our hearts. That you are great and awesome. And you have made openings, opportunities for us to know people. And for people to know us. Thank you for the church and what it really means. Help us to to fill out that meaning in each of our lives and accomplish it just the way we should. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's my desire, my longing today that the Lord put somebody already in your mind. Maybe it's a friend that you have that you need to develop. Maybe it's a person that, um, you know, they've kept popping up on your radar screen and the Lord's now saying to you, there's a reason for that. There's a reason I've been pointing that person to you. I don't believe in coincidence. God's will is working even when we cross somebody in the grocery store or we wave at somebody going down the street. And if you've seen somebody four or five times this past week or two, God's doing something. He's pointing you most likely to that person. So I'm desiring, I pray that you'll be able to be receptive to Him leading you to somebody to partner with. To be friends with. I also want you to know. This is the heart and soul of what a church is about. This is what we can be. If we can love each other. With the power of Christ. And be friends to the ultimate end. He will use us. In tremendous ways. In the world around us. So let the Lord speak to you this morning. If you need to come. Come to the altar. Maybe pray for a friend that you have. That you need to lift up. If you need to come speak with me, let me pray with you uh, over a particular need. I'd be joyfully delighted to do that. You want to know what it means to have the best friend? That's Jesus. Why don't you come talk to me about that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We're going to stand and we're going to sing together. And you all respond as the Lord leads you. Let's stand.